Welcome to Room 101. Room 101, where we go one-on-one -on -one with the great minds shaping the future. Meet the innovators in sustainable architecture. You've got to build buildings that give back more than they take. Green product design. By designing better, greener products that work. Alternative fuels. Biodiesel is like a gateway. It's a gateway drug. And ethical fashion. Green choices and, and green lifestyle and, and green fashion doesn't have to be a bummer. It doesn't have to be a compromise. It doesn't have to suck. Educate yourself on world events. And I see global warring and global warming as being very, very intimately connected. From the people who've experienced them firsthand. We stood at the edge of villages and watched the government and the Janjaweed attack and burn and, and loot everything out of these villages. And be inspired by the young entrepreneurs who are revolutionizing the way we do business. You know, garbage is a commodity people are willing to pay you to get rid of. So that was sort of cool, you know, you get paid on both ends, it's a cool eco-business model. Get smart with Room 101. I'm Sarah Backhouse and welcome to G Living's Room 101. Today we'll be joined by John Picard, architect, entrepreneur, environmental specialist and sustainability expert. Thanks for joining us, John. My pleasure. You know, when were you first aware that you were interested in the environment? In the mid-80s, I just finished building, I think, two of the most expensive houses ever built. And MTV had a 15-second PSA that said, while you watch this, 1,500 acres of rainforest were cut down. Did you know that? And it just went boom. I never paid attention to any of that stuff. I was getting into my Ferrari. I was ordering a helicopter. <laughs> I can I see you in the 80s. with it. <laughs> totally killing it. Right. It was at the top of my game. I was building more stuff than anybody else in town. At a tough time, the economy was down, and I was just killing it. And that haunted me. There was a big void. I never felt like I was meant to be doing what I'd been doing for the last 10 or 15 years. So I was searching for something that had a lot more meaning. When I quit doing my day job, I spent two years just exploring and I got caught up in the environmental community and quickly found myself focused on issues relating to species extinction and things out on the water. So I worked a lot with Sam Labuddy on the tuna dolphin issue, drift net causes, a lot of stuff that was happening in Mexico at the time. Was anger a driving force at the time? Yeah, when you saw what we saw firsthand in the water, you know, you can go out any night in a zodiac and take a look at a drift net and you wanted to kill somebody when you came in. It was criminal what they're doing. They're fishing where fish nest. They're catching babies. For every one pound of fish they would catch, they would take nine and kill it or bycatch it. They would torture these animals. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen a dolphin pulled through a power block on a persane, or if you've ever seen a small skiff skipper throw a half stick of dynamite to deaden the sonar on the bull dolphins so that they swim in a circle. And what happens it naturally is tuna herd underneath dolphin. Mm. So they would stun the dolphin, they'd circle them, they'd, they'd drag the boat out, they'd put a big persane that looks like a purse, like a sack. They'd capture the tuna and the dolphin. They could back down and let the tuna, the, the dolphin out, but they wouldn't. They'd pull them in and they'd, for every 50 tuna that were caught, they'd kill 200 dolphin. And we tried to stop that for three days. And then the Coast Guard ushered them in to the catch. They caught three dolphins and we just cried. and. Yeah, we were angry. And I thought when I was doing the houses, I'd reached a low, or at least things were at a low, compared to what I saw what we do to species that have almost the same primordial cell structure as ours. It just, I was depressed. Mm -hmm. And that's what drove me to get into the place of rebuilding and redesigning and looking at doing things, working with nature and not against it. And I just care about life. I mean, I just, I don't think people should be out there hunting. I think, you know, we should be out there protecting things, not killing them. How did you manage to overcome your anger and, uh, you know, turn it into a more positive energy? Drugs, no. <laughs> um, my anger didn't end until about two years ago when I manifested the fact that, you know, I had to be my whole self to get through it. And so I actually grew my company on anger and, and I used it. You know, I got the call at 4 o'clock in the morning with Greenpeace to go down to San Pedro to meet a Panamanian ship that had carried 5,000 acres of tropical hardwoods that they would use to make building sets for films at Warner and Sony and Fox. 
My first two clients as an environmental consultant were Warner and Sony. And so the day before, I was going to go out on this campaign with Campbell Plowden from Greenpeace, whose whole back was burned from blocking Russian harpoon guns. Well, that's so here I am sitting in my Zodiac. They had all been arrested. They went out earlier in the night, and I was their last hope to get some climbers on the ship. This was, a, this was the real turning point for me, because I'd already stopped being John Picard 1.0, the builder son of moonshot john picard senior and i'd moved into my that crossroads in my life in my early 30s to i'm going to do something that i'm going to leave my mark and my mark is i'm going to build green i'm going to stay a contractor but i'm going to make things happen in a way that respects nature so i called the head of sony and i called the head of warner brothers and said i'm going to go out tonight with rainforest action network and greenpeace and I'm gonna petition on the news tomorrow and put banners on the side of a ship that carries the wood that you make your sets. And they said, are we doing the wrong thing? And I said, yeah. And they said, you better go do it. And I said, well, no. I still wanna get fired. And they said, we won't. If we're doing the wrong thing, you gotta go do the right thing. And so no. the night that I went out on that boat, the fact that I did that, it made coming to work the next day that much better. That was Well, that's um, admirable that they took that stand, actually. I thought, you know, cynically yeah. it could have gone the other way. But listen, there's a I lot to talk here. about here. We're going to go back more with more yep. clients of yours and case studies after the break. We're here with John Picard in Room 101. Welcome back to G Living's Room 101. I'm Sarah Backhouse and I'm joined by John Picard. He's on a mission to make the world green. And uh, was there anything that drove you in that direction? It's not just saving the planet, it's this next new economy. And the next economy is a natural systems economy. Up until now, it's been a world dominated by male design programs of risk, fear, and liability. The whole world's built on low bids, and it's built on a profit center that makes a lot of people a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And the next economy, the next industrial revolution, the gain is going to go to the company that mimics nature, because in uh -huh. nature there's no waste. They'll be the most profitable companies. So the bottom line of green in the next hundred years is black. It is all about bank. Uh. It is all about new taxes, new incentives, new enterprise zones, a carbon economy, premium economies. You hear sustainability and you hear green. Guess where the game already is? It's beyond that. It's regenerative design. It's restorative patterns. We have everything we need to create a restorative economy. The important part of that is, is that the same thing that fuels what has brought us all these problems is going to fuel the solution. So if I'm in talking to a big developer, the biggest developers in the world, and they're like, we want to go green, we want to be sustainable, I said, don't bother. You've go got to go step. right into restoring the planet. You've got to build buildings that give back more than they take. And they're like, can we do it? And yes. Um, let's talk about Interface. It was a petrochemical industrial business and you transformed that into something very sustainable. Can you give us a brief sure. history of that? I had a project called the Energy Resource Center. I had to build a building in Downey for the gas company that reflected energy technologies and so I went out looking for partners. So when we came to getting carpet, I just read Paul Hawkins' book, The Ecology of Commerce, and it said you shouldn't own your Sony television. Sony should. And when they're, you're done with it, you turn it back in and they make a new TV from the old TV. So I showed up at Interface's doorstep and said, you guys don't get it. You don't want to sell me the carpet. You want to loan it to me. Then you want to come back and shave the face fiber off and make new carpet from the old. A year later, it happened. Interface is now the first name in industrial ecology. Walmart takes their cues from Interface. GE takes their cues from Interface. The board want to sit down and reinvent their organizing principles around a natural systems economy. And that will sustain the next right. recession, the next war, the next tsunami, because it isn't about a survival pattern. Mm -hmm. It's based on evolving. It's based on adapting. They may not understand green building, they may not understand the environmental technologies that it takes to change the process of what they take from the planet to make something for us to have all mm -hmm. these conveniences in life. But what they do know is that the marketplace is shifting to a place where people really start to wonder, this is what your company makes, but what do you stand for? What's mm -hmm. in the future for my kids and their kids? Is your product taking away from my family's future? And if sure. it is, I'm going to find a company that it's not. 
there'll be more and more companies doing this. That, that's the point. Companies need to be much, much more responsible for what they make okay. and particularly what it takes to make them. Wonderful. We'll look forward to that. Uh, we are going to take a quick break now. We're coming back with John Picard and talk more about his clients. Coming up, BP. You're watching Room 101. Welcome back to G Living's Room 101. I'm Sarah Backhouse and joining me here is John Picard. Moving on to uh, BP now. Uh, this is an interesting one because obviously this is a company that does not have a great environmental track record. Guilty. <laughs> not good stuff going on in Alaska, not good stuff going on in Lake Michigan. I mean, you know, and, and a company that's kind of, you know, uh, often accused of greenwashing, you know, they're into alternative energies now and doing all this stuff, but people are like, huh, is that just a front so they can keep on, you know, raping and pillaging the earth? What's your involvement with them and what are you, you hoping to, uh, to do with BP? Everything you said, I think, is fairly accurate. Um, I don't think they're greenwashing. I think they're into the market of beyond petroleum. When John Lord went after that, and they, they're, they're number one in wind, they're number one in solar. They're building a 500 megawatt hydrogen power plant down in LA Harbor right now. Um, Texas City, Alaska, the stuff happening in Michigan. They're a big company. They're making mistakes all over the place. Everything I've done with them in the last two years has been genuine, but that's not why I made the decision to do what I did with them. I'm not going to discount any company for, for, you know, my whole thing is to infiltrate and move them to a different place. I did it with Interface. I did it with The Gap. I did it with Sony. I've done it with Compaq. I did it with Williams Sonoma. I mean, I did it with 20 other companies. And I think it was a natural step and an ascension for me to get into the hottest zone that I could be in. So the top 15 or 20 companies that have caused most of the big problems in the first industrial revolution should be where I should spend the second half of my life. I'm going to be here for less time than I've already been here and i got to make every moment count. So if I can go in and I can create a the kind of change and the kind of epic opportunities that have happened in these other companies with a lot less starting point. If I can do that at BP, then that's where I belong. That's where I'm best served. And I'm challenged. A, a lot of the same friends that I did the direct action campaigns just can't believe that I'm sleeping with the enemy. Right. I'm not sleeping with them. They're paying me. And they're paying me to do something. And I'm doing everything on the same basis that I did it for Ray and all the other companies. The fact of the matter is, they give me more resources, more opportunity to fail in the direction of natural systems energy, designing their new stations, and they're not, I don't see them banging their chest. I mean, But, but they have sounds, a lot of money. I mean, you say you're not sleeping with them, they're paying you. I mean, isn't that, you know, yeah. you're more in bed with them then. And maybe they've got endless resources because their main business is oil. Yep. We need to create an 80% efficiency factor in the next 10 years. You find another vehicle that I can jump on and drive that, that I'm in. There aren't any. I've been in this for 25 years. I'm on firm ground when I tell you the companies that brought the problem are the ones that are going to take us out. That's They don't understand natural systems economies. They don't understand green building design. They haven't understood efficiencies as a marketplace. They don't think the customers were really driven by that. They're waking up to that. They're crying out for that kind of a campaign within the company and no one's perfect I mean I've, I'm working with several companies that you know you get right up to the point it's the clutch decision are we going to spend more money to do the right thing or not and typically unless the payback is really exceptional they say no we're going to pass so for 20 years I've been there with a green agenda and I end up being value engineered or an alternate to the right thing so I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I'm not uncomfortable about it. Right. And I think my best work's going to come out of that relationship. And I think if you're looking to change somebody big and problematic or just big in the energy world, they're it. And, you know, would I go work for Shell? Maybe. Would I work for ExxonMobil? Absolutely not. And we don't have enough time to go into those differences. But sure. there are significant differences between BP and the other three companies that are out there. Okay, we're joined here with John Picard. We're discussing one of his clients. BP, a controversial one to say the least. I guess what I wanted to ask you, John, is, you know, do you think they're sincere in their hunt for alternative energies? 
Yeah, I think that the work that the people that I've met, I've met the most senior people in the company. Um, listen, if I smell bullshit or I think I'm wasting my time, just like I said, I'm not. I'm gone. And I think they're trying to not just bring me in, but other people like me to reestablish their organizing principles. I think they're looking at a clock of 47 or 50 years and right. they're oil, they're, they've got to find a way to survive. Right. What's the next agenda for them? And I can't imagine it being anything other than alternative energy. Right. I guess that's the one thing for me as well. It's, you know, it's a finite resource, it's going to end and what then? So You should hope that I'm successful. You know why? Because if I'm not, nuclear power is going to come raining in here in biblical proportions. You're watching Room 101. The tipping point, it only takes about 8% of the population for us to shift into an entire new Where are we at now, right now? If you say 8%, where are we at I right think now? We went, I think we went beyond it. Yeah. Somewhere this year, I feel it. Yeah, I, we've passed it. Who se could ever two, push those 2007 numbers. was the tipping point? I, I think, I, you know, and everyone's going to look back on Gore's film. Mm. I think Gore's film mm -hmm. just brought us together to mm. go and, and went, we had that holy shit moment about we watched the carbon scale, yeah. the population scale, and temperature, all those correlated. And I think everybody went, oh my God. And in the it's same related. moment in the 11th hour, when you hear for the first time that the planet could sustain a billion people with current natural sun income and beyond that, we're overshooting the planet's capacity. And everyone's like, well, what the hell have we been mm -hmm. doing? Why didn't somebody do something sure. about that? Government, our country, the planet overall is not going to take care of us. You know what's going to go down? It's going to happen within your home first. Then it's going to happen within your community. Sure. It's going to happen within your school. And that's what is driving this, the first phase of this natural systems economy. So people are starting to activate on what they know are facts that they should be concerned about. I've met people, seen the technologies, experienced massive change in a short period of time, enough so that I go home and I have absolute assurity that my kids are in a good place. People are generally good. People are generally caring. People love. Mm -hmm. Look how quickly the environmental movement has come in the last 24 months. Look at how much has happened in the last 12. And in my clock speed, you can't imagine what's happened in the last 60 days. And the year ahead is just incredible. It's a competition for my time for big visionary sessions by bigger and bigger companies who are not just talking, but they're reorganizing their companies on this. So I've got a big smile on my face. So from somebody who in the mid 80s looked around at when we were at our worst, it's taken me this long. I'm at a point in my life where I know I'm not going to live my life half asleep. On that note, John Picard, there's so much more to discuss. We'll have to get you back in for another session, but oh, for you heard sure. it here first. We've reached the tipping point, and it's up to every one of us to look after our own environment, and then as a bigger picture, that will be good for the future. Yep. So thank you once again for joining us. John, we'll be back in a few weeks to discuss India and China and the impact they will make on the global environment. So be sure to tune back in for that one here at Room 101 on G Living.